oh, look, my clock says 6 p.m. So I guess we're going to go ahead and get started. For those that don't know me, my name is John Watts with Watts Digital Imaging here in San Diego. And I am a post-processing specialist for photographers. You take the perfect shot and I help you get the absolute most out of it, whether it's through Photoshop instruction and services, high-end digital light jet printing and uh, finishing and or color management products and services. So a little bit about me, we're, not, we're gonna try to jet through these. I know a lot of this may seem redundant to some of you. First of all, I wanna thank all of you for joining tonight. I really appreciate taking that time out of your busy schedule to uh, join us tonight. I Obviously, I encourage uh, questions through the chat. So if you've got anything, I pretty much chat, chat. I can say this, I pretty much check the chat. So if you got any questions, go for it. Uh, just to reiterate, because Kathy was asking about this earlier, the version of Photoshop that I'm using or will be using is uh, Photoshop 2020, whatever the latest version is. I just automatically update them as they come in. Um, I am on a Mac, but in the rare cases where there's a difference between what a Mac and a PC can do, I will make sure and mention that for you. Um, anything that I'm going to show you tonight will work on pretty much any version of Photoshop Creative Cloud and on, all, we'll also work in Lightroom, although I'm not going to show you that tonight, but the same principles will apply. Uh, I'm checking my, oh yes, there's also a 2080 rule, if you will, and when we're dealing with a subject that, that can be technical, you're gonna remember 10 or 20% of it, and you're gonna forget the other 80, 90% of it. What you forget, hopefully you're gonna be in the notes, which are provided, or if you cannot find the answer to your question, please, please, please email me why should you listen to me? So let's uh, do a quick PowerPoint. Um, I have been doing this crazy business since I had hair, as you can see here. In fact, let me, uh, there we go, get my mouse pointer. Yes, that was my hair. Girls would, would have died for my hair back in my surfing days. And I did come out here for surfing uh, and uh, got involved in the one hour, one hour lab craze and discovered I had a real penchant for post-processing, which is, wasn't even called that then, but I've been a custom printer my whole life. And so uh, that's essentially what I'm just using different tools now. You can see that God does indeed have a sense of humor. My hair is just a wee bit shorter, but as you can tell from that picture, I'm much more handsome today. Uh, let's see here. Let's go ahead and go on. So I've been doing this for a while, as you can, as you can see, for a living. In 1984, we became self-employed and created Watts Color Lab. And in fact, Chuck and I were just talking about this on the phone yesterday. This is Watts Color Lab. This is a dark room. That is a, a, a non-digital uh, 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 enlarger. That's a an analog enlarger, you know, easels and lenses and critical grain focusers. And that little white bottle is a bottle of film cleaner. This is the dark room portion. Uh, that's a paper processor, developer, bleach fix, all that good stuff. All we did in Watts Color Lab, by the way, were custom type R prints and slides, uh, prints from slides, nothing else. Let's go ahead and go on. What am I doing these days? Uh, I'm doing a lot of, well, let's start at the bottom and work our way up. This is a dark room, the, the dark room current. This is the light jet line. And this is a dark room inside there. And then this is the paper processor. But instead of using the old analog and larger, now we have digital printers which print uh, with light on sensitometric photographic paper with a red, green, and blue laser. So I actually have to load these in the dark and unload them in the dark and then process them through this machine in the dark. So we're actually in the dark. It is a dark, dark room and it, uh, uh, you know, for a short period of time, you actually have to be in the dark. There's a little glow tape. I think Patrick's been in there for sure and he can tell you that it's kind of fun. It's a, it's a real trippy dark room. It's very high tech and probably one of the best on the planet and it's here in Scripps Poway. If you're ever interested, by the way, in visiting the dark, the light jet line, um, it's in Scripps Poway. Oh, you know, we can't do that. I, I, I'm just automatically saying that. Eventually, once we get through all this COVID-19 mess, uh, we can arrange if you guys would like to come by it for, and, and take a tour of the place. And let's see. Uh, yeah, I, I, that's me, grandpa, definitely a grandpa. I do a lot of public speaking, although right now it's all online and it's a totally different animal. Here's a couple of folks that uh, I'm sure some of the people on this list are familiar with. That's David King right there and that's Larry Vogel, two awesome, awesome individuals. We're gonna actually talk about Dave tonight and some of his beliefs, which I can guarantee you are also shared by Larry. And we'll talk about that in the second, uh, well, the last half hour of the program tonight. 
let's see what else we got here. Okay, let's go ahead and go to the notes. That's uh, pretty much uh, pretty much it about me. Just uh, know that I generally figured out what works and what doesn't generally because uh, the old those of us that have uh, are of uh, what what do we say late 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 middle age we've discovered how much we really don't know and so that's still kind of true but when it comes to printing i've, I've kind of got it dialed in most of the time so let's talk about this what is uh y color management and, and i'm by the way i'm on page one of the notes if you'd like to follow along so proper color management will allow you to print with a great degree of consistency and repeatability on either your inkjet printer or through a custom print lab and we're going to talk about both of those in, in, in some more detail tonight. So basically, if color management is set up properly, it will allow you to print what you see on your monitor with a large degree of accuracy. And the old adage, WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get, it has a tendency to hold true with a great degree of accuracy. So what is a profile? And by the way, I'm on the second paragraph. Uh, Profile, you hear that a lot. A profile is really just a small file. In fact, it's actually a text file when you get right down to it. And they're rarely over anywhere from two to six or even smaller, two to six megabytes in size. And it's just a small file that tells your computer how to act and what to do and from a color management standpoint. And then there are two types of, of profiles that we're going to talk about tonight. One is a monitor profile and the other are printer profiles. So Let's go on to the next page here. You'll notice on page one that there are three steps to successful color management. We're going to go each, over each one of these steps in much greater detail. But step one is to calibrate your monitor and create a monitor profile. Step two is to use the proper printer profile or create a custom printer profile. Now remember, I talked about two different kinds of profiles. We got one for your monitor and one for your printer. And step three is to assure that you have proper lighting conditions and perception. And that's one that's probably the most overlooked and we'll spend quite a bit of time on that tonight too. And I know that this whole color management thing can get really confusing and it's, it's sometimes it's like going to the dentist for people and I understand that. I wanna make this as easy as possible. So just remember that anytime you have a challenge with proper color management after you've tried setting things up, it 99% of the time comes back to one of these three steps listed above not being quite right. The point being, if you got questions, call or email me. Uh, I can certainly help you out one way or another. A lot of times it's just something procedural. You just need to check one more box and you're ready to go. Uh, either way, I'm pretty good at uh, um, uh, troubleshooting. It can help you if you decide to go rock and roll with this. So let's go ahead and go to step one. I'm on page two now. I should also mention at the very beginning of this of these notes, there's a whole set of links to various things that I'll talk about tonight. So I would uh, encourage you to take a look at those. In fact, uh, I've talked about this before and I didn't even uh, put this in this, this PowerPoint, uh, but uh, how do you learn this program or whatever? And one of the things that I really stress that's free, just take some time is homework. So I'm gonna be talking about a lot of things tonight that you'll be able to go to the blog post and, and follow up on that homework and see what it is I'm talking about, perhaps in greater detail. And hey, if you got more questions, you can always uh, email me and we'll figure them out. So let's go back to step one, calibrate your monitor and create a monitor profile. There is a, an important color management rule here. To take advantage of all that your printer has to offer, match your monitor to your best printer output, not the other way around. Too many people I know take their printer out of the box, set it up, and I'm, when I talk printer, by the way, I'm talking Printers designed for photo output. I'm not talking about a all-in-one printer or anything like that. I'm talking about something designed specifically for printing. A Canon, Epson, HP all make great, great printers. I happen to be partial Epson, but that's kind of like do you like Fords or Chevys? Uh, I have my reasons. I suppose everybody does, which is what makes the world go around. But again, take advantage of your your printer has to offer. Match your monitor to your best printer output, not the other way around. Most people take the printer and the monitor straight out of the box, set them up, and they look at their monitor and they go, oh, okay, and they, they print, it looks good on the monitor, and they print it out, and everything's too light, so they go in to the printer uh, driver and start adjusting your colors and your brightness and whatever, and no, 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 no. So I also say to best printer output, and that's assuming that you're going to use printer profiles, which we'll talk about in step two. So I just want to make you aware that you're just taking it out of the box and setting it up. If you happen to get good results the first time, you just got extremely lucky. But eventually, you're probably going to want to figure out what's going on here. 
your monitor must be properly, I'm reading now from page uh, two, uh, it's you monitor is probably the most important step to me uh, of the three steps. Even if you don't have your own printer or you send your prints, your files out for prints, you want to get that monitor calibrated and profiled so you have a standard to come back to. You're never going to get your monitor to be a 100% accurate representation of your, your print due to different physical light properties between your monitor, which is emitted light, and your print, which is reflective light. It's never going to be perfect, but it'll be extremely clo close, resulting in savings, time, money, frustration, everything. So the best way to calibrate, and I'm still on page two here, the best way to calibrate and profile your monitor is to invest in a monitor profiling device, such as the X1, I sorry, X right, I1 Display Pro or the Data Color Spider X. And they run between 225 and 250. And what is it? Let me go back a step and you can see this little deal hanging down here, that's a monitor profiling hardware and they come with software and you install them both and you plop it on there and you go through a series of steps and it'll go, Okay, I want my color to be a certain uh, uh, Kelvin value, gamma, which is midtone contrast, and brightness, those three, which is what these are right here. So first, let's talk about the X-Rite right, I1 Display Pro or Plus. Not that, uh, I would only use one of those two. They run a street price from 225 to 275. The only difference between the I, and by the way, this is not in the notes. So if, if you're, you're confused and you don't get a chance to write it down and you have more questions, let me know. x write offers three models, if you will. Data Color offers two models. Uh, and it really is the same piece of hardware with different software. The x write i1 Display Pro or plus is different than the studio. I would not get the studio because it has a real inflexible user interface and does not have an advanced mode, which is something that I suggest you have so that you can pick what we're talking about here. Uh, if I, and I'm on page two, if you if monitor profile is not an option right now, you can always use the by eye calculators. Uh, but I'm going to let you look through that if you want to do that. I do not recommend that, and I'll show you why when we get to uh, lighting, perception, all that, that sort of thing. Uh, let's go to page three. Oh, and I should also mention in that blog post link that you see on page two for, uh, there's a post on my blog for more on calibrating and profiling your monitor. It has a video there that you can use uh, that makes it really, really easy to walk through. Let's go back to page three, sorry about that. How the monitor profiler works, it basically varies between the monitor profiling manufacturers, but you install the software, plug the colorimeter into your computer, and then you attach the colorimeter to your monitor, it just hangs at the top there, and then you start your software using an advanced mode and we'll run through the step-by-step -step procedures. Then you will save the profile that's generated. So what happens, the profile, uh, will, I'm sorry, the colorimeter, which is the hardware that hangs off of there, is gonna look at that monitor and say, hey, that's not gray, it's blue gray, so you need to correct for that. Uh, that's a very simple example of what the monitor profile will do. It'll get all those colors, it'll get the absolute most out of your printer, and that's really what you're looking for. Now, I'm sorry, out of your out of your monitor. Use the advanced mode in your software. There, oh, by the way, on the box, when you see anything in a box in my notes, just so you know, that means it's probably pretty darn important. So if you look on page three, there's a box at the top that says using the advanced mode in your software will allow you to choose three specific values. And you'll see on the screen here uh, that once you choose the advanced mode, there's gonna have a starting point, and I'll explain that in a minute. I would start with 5,500 degrees Kelvin, 2.2 gamma, 110 lumens. Most monitors, uh, let's see, Patrick has, what about getting the X-Rite option that also allows you to calibrate your printer? I would not do that for a couple of reasons, mainly because the software that comes with that package, and they're not cheap, they're $1,500. That package is, is, unless you're really into it, I wouldn't bother it. Instead, I'd pay someone like me to do it because I invested something like $4,000 in the software that I use, which is not an, an X-Rite uh, uh, software. Uh, so if you're going to get a custom printer profile, it's I know when we get to printers, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about there. Let me go ahead and get back to these uh, advanced media. I, I also on page three, I say I say starting point because each system is a bit different. You will see trends in your printing. Of the three steps of successful color management, you may need to zero this one in 
to get your optimal optimal values for your particular system. The other two printer profiles and proper lighting and, and perception um, it is what it is. Uh, here's a procedure for zeroing in if you have optimal monitor settings. So let's say you calibrated and profiled your monitor at 5,500, 2.2, and 110, just like we see here. And consistently, not the first time, but you consistently start seeing your prints coming out a little bit darker than what you, in other words, if you use a, a light source, and we'll talk about that to look at your print and look at your monitor and your print looks, uh, what did I say, darker? Yeah, it looks darker, then you're gonna wanna reprofile re and do it at 120 lumens, a little bit brighter, okay? until you get what you want. It talks a lot about that. I don't wanna to get too much into the procedural uh, as much as uh, on page three, you'll notice some stuff. This will be part of your homework to kind of check this out uh, about what we're talking about. And it also a note of caution there before you make any of these adjustments, all aspects of your color management must be in order. So if you calibrate and profile your monitor, but don't use custom or use printer profiles for your printer, then you're just going to be chasing uh, uh, like a dog chasing its tail. So you want to make sure that you got all three of those steps uh, uh, in order, and having your color management house in order, if you will. Also, uh, how often to cal calibrate? Uh, monitors have a tendency to drift color wise. So you're gonna to wanna to ca calibrate and recalibrate and reprofile on a regular basis, approximately every, it says on, on the nose 60 to 90 days, but in a lot of the newer monitors, you can probably go 90 to 120 days. It only takes about 15 minutes, by the way. And I should also mention if, if money is an issue to get into this, since you only need her for 15 or 20 minutes, uh, maybe you can get together with another photographer or two and the three of you can get together. And if you're, if it's convenient, just like a library card, just give it to one of those people. Uh, again, it's something that I would highly recommend uh, to get uh, your color management system started. So let's see, we're gonna, oh, laptop monitors, by the way, are notoriously hard to calibrate and profile and tend to drift really quickly. The only exception to that are, are MacBook Pros. Uh, they are have a, a graphics cards that are very robust uh, in them. So uh, I, I have a MacBook Pro. That's what we're on right now. And the color, I, I'll check it every three or four months and it, it drifts so little, it's almost not worth bothering with. But I do because that's what you should do. All right, let's go to step two. And Patrick, this should answer some of your questions about creating your own printer profile. So step two says, use the proper printer profile or create a custom printer profile. I need you to know that all printers are different. The printer profile characterizes the behavior of your printer paper ink combination, okay? If you have 10 Epson P600 sitting in a row and you don't use uh, uh, printer profiles, all of them are gonna be different, okay? So th that that's something you just kind of need to keep in mind that if, if you, have a profile, it is device dependent, by the way. In other words, you can't use a printer profile for an Epson 2880 and use it on an Epson P600. Two different animals. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, this should answer, I think, your questions here, Patrick. Choices for printer profiles, and by the way, um, uh, this is all on, I, I should have mentioned, we're on page four, and I apologize for that. So again, we're on page four and there are choices for printer profiles. Uh, if you're using your own printer, well, if you're using an outside print lab, you can use printer profiles uh, provided by your custom print lab, but they're really only for inform informational purposes via soft proofing. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute, but just know that, yes, if you have a calibrated and profile monitor and you can get the printer profiles out of the lab you're using, you can plug those in and soft proof your image and know a little more accurately what it's gonna look like. I don't use soft proofing very often, but we'll talk about that as we go along. If you have your own photo inkjet printer, you have two choices. You can use the canned printer profiles, which come with the machine, uh, or you can use custom printer profiles. And that's something that I, a service that I provide. And there's a link for that at the bottom of page four, if you're interested in that. The CAN profile, printer profiles are pretty darn good, by the way. Um, they've gotten a lot better as time goes on. All they're doing is averaging a whole bunch of printers trying to give you a CAN printer profile. So it's still not specifically for your inkjet printer. So you might wanna consider investing in custom printer profiles. 
if that's something you're interested in, we can talk about that later. And let's see, there were, oh, uh, can printer profiles. I should also mention that if you have uh, a, a whatever printer model you've got and you're using a paper like say Red River or Hana Mule, fine art paper, chances are if it's a fairly modern printer in the last two or three years, you can go to Hana Mule's or Red River's website and download their canned printer profiles. Using a printer profile is better than nothing. And we will talk about that as we go along. I'll, I will show you before uh, we're done with the color management portion, if we have time, how to print using a printer profile, whether it's canned or custom. Okay, let's see, what do we got next? Step three, Chris says, I have a MacBook Pro. What type of monitor would you recommend for larger viewing color? Uh, good question. I am very partial to the ViewSonics. Anything with a P in it for professional is a pretty darn good monitor. The one I'm using, I don't know the model number. I'll have to get it for you. If you would email me later, I'll make sure and get it. But I think it's a P2768. Don't quote me on that. Uh, it's 27 inches wide with panoramic. I think I paid about $450 for it. And it's a wonderful, wonderful monitor. Uh, there now. I, by the way, and while I'm thinking about it, I don't like 4K monitors. Now, the monitor I just quoted you is a 2K monitor. If you have a 4K monitor, there's a couple of challenges with it. One, the image can look so sharp; it is an unrealistic representation of what your sharpening would look like in your final image. It can be. Some people like it. The second thing about 4K monitors, particularly if you have oh eyes like me of late, late, late <clears throat> middle age, when you use the 4K function, all your icons, your type are so small that it's really hard to work with. Now, that's just my personal opinion. But uh, ViewSonic, I'm partial to. Dell makes a great monitor. There's a lot of good monitors out there. If you have a, a question about a particular monitor, please just email me before you purchase it, and I'll be more than happy to check it out for you. Okay, let's go to page step three of the three steps to successful color management. Assure that you have proper lighting conditions and perception. And to me, this a lot of times is the most overlooked step in color management, without a doubt. It, do not underestimate how easily our eyes and by extension our brain can be tricked. Mag magicians make a fortune off of this. Perception is not always uh, the reality. The hand is indeed quicker than the eye. We've all seen that. That's how magicians make a living. So what we want to do is we want to get our proper lighting conditions and perception kind of zeroed in so we know where we might be getting tricked. And uh, a good example of, of this perception is not always reality. Have, have you ever, and I, I, this is on page six too, have you ever walked inside a building after being outside in bright sunlight and had to wait for your eyes to adjust to the inside lighting conditions? Our eyes adjust to the environment around us, which is why we are working on your, your images on your monitor is important too. And I'll get to those five things in a minute. But I wanna show you another reason why I would never use a bi-eye uh, monitor calibration and instead will use the colorimeter, the monitor profiling package. And by the way, if any of you know who, uh, know pilots, private pilots or any kind of pilots, when when they have to get an instrument rating, they actually put a hood on their eyes when they're flying because their vertigo and all sorts of stuff can play havoc with you if you're in the middle of a cloud and you better know what your instruments say. So again, the same thing, perception is not always reality. Let me prove that to you here over the next five, six minutes or so. What I'd like you to do is on the screen is I would like you to stare at the black X right in the middle. And you'll notice that in your periphery of your vision, you'll see a green ball going clockwise around those magenta balls, right? Well, guess what? It doesn't exist. That green ball is a trick. Of, it's, it's Your eyes are being tricked. And that green ball's not there. All right, let's go to the next one. This one's a little more subtle but I think you'll, you'll enjoy it just the same. If you look at the intersections of the light and or the dark lines when this changes, you're gonna see some little gray squares. Let me get this going. You see how there's little gray squares where the skinny lines, whether they're white or black are? Again, those gray squares do not exist. It is a trick of your eye. And uh, so again, you wanna give yourself every advantage that you can. Let's go to the next one. 
this one used to be my favorite one, mainly mainly because of the color, because at one time I was a Charger fan, but they're dead to me, the Rapscallions, after moving to Los Angeles and see it's blue and gold. Now watch this. Now that I've put down the Chargers, boo hiss, I'm going to play this. And you're going to see the vertical black bars disappear. When they do, the black bars disappear. You'll see that it, the blue and the gold rectangles move smoothly. But when you have the vertical black bars, that it seems to be jumping from bar to bar. Again, it's just a trick of the eye. It really is going smoothly the whole way. Isn't this fun stuff? A show of hands, please. Oh, wait, forgot. I love that joke. Okay, here, this one's really tricky. Uh, uh, trippy is a better word. If you look, you'll see a lime green spiral, and you're also going to see a aqua blue spiral. You see them? Okay, be prepared to be freaked out because that aqua blue spiral and the lime green spiral are exactly the same color. I've used an eyedropper to check it because I didn't believe it at first either. But that lime green spiral and the blue spiral are the same color. Why does it look different? Because the green spiral has orange ba uh, bars going through it and the blue sp spiral has purple going through it. Again, it's just a trick of the eye. And this one, do not do this one while you're drinking because all the movement you see is in your eyeball. None of it is in the graphic that you see on the screen none zero zilch nada now on these next three i'm going to need to there we go okay this is really trippy that gray square is a 50 percent gray watch what happens when he slides it to the left he slides it to the right and yet that's the same color which uh should give you an idea of which uh how to decide whether you need a black mat or a white mat for the fair. You need to put your print against a black background or a white background to see which really works for the image. But again, just a trick of the eye. Let me go to the next one here. Okay, you see the orange ball in the middle? That orange ball is exactly the same size, whether it's being squeezed by the gray balls or not. It is not changing size. I know, trippy. And last, no, not last, but close. What I'd like you to do is stare at the spiral at the top there for about 15 seconds or so, right in the middle. I'll sing the uh, uh, Jeopardy theme. Okay, I won't. This is why I'm a drummer and not a singer. And then after about 15 seconds or so, go down to the starry, starry night of Mr. Van Gogh. And you will see it moving. I'm going to do that for a little bit longer because this one's fun. Give it a good 15 seconds. And then go down and look at it, and you'll see it actually moving. And if anybody wants these, just let me know. I'll be more than happy to send these to you, any of these JPEGs. And let's see, last but certainly not least, what I'd like you to do is stare at the white dot on the nose here for about 15 seconds, and then look over to the right-hand side. Okay, that was bad. Eh? Is that a handsome devil or what? That's a good looking guy. Eh? So I made a little poem here that says rods and cones are nature's own, but our eyes will still deceive us. And that is so true. All right. So just uh, this is why you do not want to use a by eye calibration device. Uh, that's built into Windows or, or Mac. Instead, because it really it depends on what you had for breakfast. It could depend on on a, a number of, of different things. So that being the case, we want to control that as much as possible. So now we can go back. Let me uh, get back out here. There we go. And you'll notice uh, now I'm on page six again. So our eyes adjust to the environment around us, like I said earlier, which is why when you're working on your images on your monitor, it is important to, number one, change your monitor screen theme colors to neutral gray. Number two, reduce room lighting. Number three, avoid loud wall colors. 
Number four, be conscious of the color of your clothes. And number five, use a proper light source to view prints. We'll talk about number five in a second, but let's go back up to the top. I love my grandkids and my grandkids are cuter than yours, just so you know. But that being the case, I would never use them on a background. When I did, watch this, see my background, it's gray. When you look at Photoshop, everything is gray for a reason. If it wasn't, then you would have all sorts of problems uh, uh, getting your eyes to adjust to what it needs to. Remember that environment uh, around us is uh, what is gonna cause your eyes to adjust properly. Reduce room lighting. I'll show you a picture in just a second of my setup, just so you know. Um, generally, if I'm doing critical work, I will reduce the room lighting to only a proper light source, which we'll talk a bit about in a minute, uh, being on. And if I, like my office has an east facing uh, uh, French doors by it. And so for me, if I'm gonna be working in the afternoon on critical output, I have to close those blinds. Number three, avoid loud wall colors. I like to tell this story real quick. I had a client that uh, was doing this and she kept saying, all my prints are coming out warm, warm, warm. And would you mind driving up here and checking it out? Well, she was in Pasadena, she had money, so I went up there. Turns out she was judging her prints in a room that was orange, okay? Now, I'm not saying that you need to paint your walls neutral gray, uh, but, you know, it needs, if you're in a room with any kind of bright, weird colors, you're, you're, you're going to want to avoid that. That's where your monitor should be. Be conscious of the color of your clothes. There's a reason that color management professionals or even some video sp uh, 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 type people wear black or gray. Ask, ask uh, uh, Patrick, every time he see me, I'm either wearing a black or a gray shirt. Uh, I have the largest collection of black and gray shirts known in existence and if you watch you know if you see a a, uh, uh, a special on the making of toy story and if they occasionally they'll show you the animators they're in a room with reduced lighting almost all of them are wearing black or gray clothes and the wall colors are again very subdued not a, a loud color okay let's go to the next page here and i'll spend a little more time on this proper light source in just a minute this is what my place looks like right now and you can see that I have an east-facing view over here. In the middle of the afternoon, if I'm working, I can close those completely. And then the only light I have on is a little 5,000 degree Kelvin light here. And it's not it, it it's not anything special. I, 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 in fact, you can set something up by going to Home Depot and Walmart. Maybe just Home Depot if you, you needed to. You can spend a lot of money on these things and you don't really need to. Proper light source for viewing your prints, 5,000 degrees Kelvin light is what you're looking for, or D50. No, it, the difference between 5,500K or 6,000K on your monitor and 5,000K is not like, wait, that can't be right. Remember, we're dealing with two different sources of light. One is emitted light coming through your monitor, and the other was going to be reflected light coming off of your print. So the easiest way to make a 5,000 degree Kelvin light fixture is to go spend $10 at Walmart, on a black fixture with a white, I mean, I've just got a little gooseneck thing. Uh, you can't really see it, but it's just a gooseneck with a black cover and white reflector on the inside. And then I went to Home Depot. Actually, I got them on Amazon and got 5,000 degree Kelvin bulbs to fit inside there. And I think I bought them, they, they were, you know, a three pack for $6 or something. But if you search for 5,000 degree Kelvin bulbs, whether at Amazon, Home Depot, whatever, you're going to find them eventually. Believe it or not, the people at Home Depot, or at least they used to, at Home Depot, Lowe's, those kinds of places, they get requests for 5,000K bulbs more than you might realize. So again, I would strongly suggest that you have 5,000K bulbs. Now, let's let's go back to this one up here just for a second because I want to make sure we've covered everything. Here we go. So we have covered calibrate your monitor and create a monitor profile. Use a proper printer profile and, or create a custom printer profile. No, uh, number three, assure that you have proper lighting conditions and perception. That's most of it in a nutshell right there. What I'm going to show you now is something that I don't always do, but I just, and, it's, and you'll notice that in the notes, uh, there were three steps and then an optional step, and that's what we're going to talk about. But what is soft proofing? Soft proofing is a 
let's see here. I want to make sure I got the definition right. Soft proofing is a previewing procedure that Photoshop uses to see the results of your printer profile. In other words, it allows you to view on your calibrated and profiled monitor, that's key, what your image will theoretically look like when it is printed using your printer profile. If you go to page seven, I do not bother soft proofing the vast majority of images. I use it very rarely and only when I'm working with bright electric colors, mainly the three primaries, red, green, and blue. And I'm going to show you why and why, I, when and when I would not use soft proofing when I go into Photoshop in a second. I never correct my master file by soft proofing. Never. Because what happens if I, soft, I uh, change it in my master file for my Epson P600, but then I print it on the LightJet, which has a much larger color gamut, then what are you going to do? You've already knocked uh red pixels out for instance when you shouldn't have okay so i use an example here bright red may look a certain way on your monitor but won't necessarily look that way on the print and the reason for that is is uh tonal compression and color gamut and i would urge you to you'll see a link there uh, on my blog that uh goes to a post called uh, soft proofing plus rgb color spaces and the better solution to my, in my opinion, is to get your color management house in order and then just get into the habit of making test prints. I have uh, on printing, uh, on the light jet anyway, I have about a 95% success rate on what I see on my monitor versus what my output is. Uh, and if you have your own printer, I would definitely get into the habit of uh, uh, making test prints before you yeah, go crazy with big prints. I don't normally do that with our, our light jet, but it, it's a little different animal. So uh, let's see here. I don't want to spend a whole bunch of time, but I've got a whole post on that and on RGB color spaces, which is that link that you'll find in the middle of page seven. Let's see here. I, and I, I'll, again, I'll, I'll show you in Photoshop uh, what I'm talking about. Let's see here. I'm reading my notes here to make sure I'm covering everything. Color settings, show proof, soft proof examples. Okay, that's what we're doing here. I'm I'm sorry, just checking my notes. Let's go to the next one uh, right here. I'm going to make some suggested color settings to you in Photoshop, and let me go to my notes so I make sure. And again, this is this is part of that blog post, which is what I'm I'm reading here. Oh. Um, a couple of other things about soft proofing just before I get into this. On the vast majority of images, there is almost no change between what your image looks like, soft proof versus not soft proof. Or if there's a change, it's usually not anything even remotely critical. Um, if you're up to giving it a try, a word of caution, if you get caught up in the technical minutia, and I know a lot of folks like that, uh, you may never be happy with the results as soft proofing is an imperfect science. And I mean, really, who wants to be a slave to their computer? So sometimes less is more, or as a client, Lee, client recently put it, simplify and demystify. Uh, besides, wouldn't you rather be out shooting pictures? Uh, so bottom line, if you're not sure the result you see in your monitor and you feel it's necessary, just run a small test print. And uh, again, I would urge you, this part of your homework is to spend time on this blog post right here that we, that we uh, talked about in the middle of page seven. Okay. So the next one here is we're going to talk about color spaces, and I want to explain to you about color setting, uh, color spaces before I ex make some suggestions on the color settings. The first thing is a color space is a mathematically structured model of colors with proper color management practices, which is what we're talking about today. It allows for reproducible representations of color within a particular printing or viewing environment, and we're going to choose a color setting where our goal is to end up with Adobe RGB. Now, again, if you go to this same post that I'm talking about in the middle of page seven, it'll talk about why I do not use, say for instance, Profoto or sRGB. Uh, there's drawbacks to both of them. The biggest drawback to Profoto is that over 15% of it's not even in the visible, visible spectrum. So it's, it's almost unrealistic. And uh, whereas J uh, sRGB is a much smaller consumer-based color space and shouldn't be used at all as a working color space. So my suggestion is that you use Adobe RGB uh, unless the printer specifies that you send it to them in another color space. So I urge you to spend more time on that on the color spaces. And I, if you spend uh, 15 minutes going through that post, I think it will answer a lot of your questions. Now. When, I'm going to show you how to set 
the color settings up when I open Photoshop literally in just a minute or two here. But when you change your color settings and your Adobe and you've been, let's say, using sRGB as your color space, but you're you've changed it to Adobe RGB. In fact, most cameras when you shoot a JPEG, it's got this sRGB with a whole string of numbers beside it, okay? And that's not a good color space. It's a very small bucket of colors, if you will. Working space, the be I would suggest you uh, leave it as Adobe RGB. So if you have an older image that was an sRGB, you're gonna get this embedded profile mismatch. When you do, you do not wanna use the embedded profile, which is the sRGB. You wanna convert the second radio button here. You want to convert documents colors to the working space. Okay, so I think that's pretty much it on the PowerPoint. Any questions at this point before I open up Photoshop? Groovy. Let's go to Photoshop here real quick. And let me open an image. Oh, you know why? Hold on a sec. There we go. Let's start with this one here. And I'll open up something. Let me close this just to avoid confusion. Again, we don't need the distraction of this test target right now. We're looking at this image here. This is not a spectacular image, other than it's my grandkid who's now 12 years old, so I probably should change it, but that's okay. It gets the point across. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and do what I showed you and set up my color settings, and it's edit, color settings. If you have my book, this is in the book. When you first get this menu, it's gonna look like this. These are presets that Adobe has built in right here. Okay, and each one has a different name. And I believe by default, it is the North America general purpose is the default settings, which adjusts everything that you see here. Don't let all this confuse you. The only couple things you need to worry about is what is the working space? It's sRGB, we do not want that. Color management policies, it's not asking if it's a different uh, profile mismatch or whatever. So what I do and suggest you do also is that you click on this and go to North America, pre-press two, and it will choose Adobe RGB 98. Don't worry about the CMYK gray spot. You won't have anything to do that. It will, anytime there's a profile mismatch, then it will ask when opening. Like that, uh, I showed you that profile mismatch warning. Uh, missing profile, ask when opening also. As soon as you set this, you're done. You only have to do that once, okay? That's the color setup. And if uh, I believe that is not in the notes, if you do need to do that, and you, uh, after looking at the, the uh, video when it comes out, it's not quite what you're looking for, then, you know, or you, it isn't quite making sense, just by all means, email me and we'll go from there. Now, let's go back to this, this image here. I had said that I want to show you what soft proofing is and why it might help, but most of the time doesn't. This is a real good, uh, example of an uh, of, uh, image where it really doesn't make any difference. And you're gonna find a vast majority of the images are like this. And remember, we're only using it for informational purposes only. We're not gonna change our file. We just wanna know, hey, it looks red on here. And I'll show you an image with a lot of red in a minute. But if we loaded the uh, device to simulate, which is a printer profile, then what's gonna happen? It's gonna really lose a lot of red. But in an image like this, let me use a light jet uh, profile here. Where's the one with an 18? There's one right here. Okay, so I'm gonna preview this proof condition. Here's, right now, it is soft proofed. I'm gonna unsoft proof it so you can see what it looks like in, in Adobe RGB. Ready? There. No difference, right? You might be able to see a smidge of a difference in this blue and this green, but not very much. By the way, you can tell if you're soft proofed or not because the name of the profile is in the document window. So if I uncheck preview, that's Adobe RGB, the working space. The printer is gonna print it like this. I mean, there's virtually no dis difference. Certainly not enough to mess up your master file for. I hope that makes sense. Now, let me go ahead and open another image. Nope. 
There we go. And this image has a lot of red in it. And this is uh, one of Aaron Chang's images. If anybody knows, knows who Aaron is, this is uh, his famous Malia red image. Now, this is with uh, Adobe RGB uh, in. Now let's find out what happens when we go to soft proof this. And we'll go to the same profile. Okay, there's with the profile loaded, it has the name of the profile up in the document window at the top. If I click preview off, here's before. See how all this red in here is really red? And I click and it really subdues it. Now, one of the things that I don't like about soft proofing is that when you look at this image and it's printed on a Fujiflex super gloss paper, you don't notice this color. And so it's an imperfect system at best. Do I use it occasionally? Once in a blue moon, but not very often. I just use it for informational purposes, knowing that my bright red may look a certain way on the screen, but won't necessarily look that way on the print. Mainly, again, because of the, to the printer's color gamut and tonal compression, which we talked about. Uh, oh, we're going to talk about that um, next week, as a matter of fact, on the raw class. We'll talk a lot about tonal compression. I may have mentioned it in the last couple of classes also. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Again, oh, and I should mention, let's say that you do soft proof this and you decide to print it right now. This is not where you set your printer profile. Your printer profile is in the printer, where you set your printer profile is in your printer's dialog box. So let's do that right now. Uh, so yeah, I can print this with or without it, it being in a soft proof condition, I guess is my point. I hope that makes sense. So let's go to File, Print, and I I don't have the light jet on this, so I'm just going to use the Epson Stylus 2880, the very first thing I do, and this is also in my book, and if you have challenges with it, uh, again, just uh, let me know. I'm sure we can figure, figure it out for you. So in this one here, in a, and e by the way, each printer and each Operating system is going to be a little bit different. In this one, just so you know, uh, this is a Mac, and so this is how you adjust it. There's really a couple things you want to check. We want to, particularly if it's an inkjet printer, uh, media type would be a photo paper. I'm going to call it uh, uh, glossy, just to be different. Okay. Uh, the color is you don't want to do black and white here. That you do in Photoshop. Color settings, this should be off. If it isn't, you want to turn it off. And the reason we do that is because we do not want to double color manage. We are only going to color manage in the Photoshop print dialog box, not the Epson print dialog box. And then the third thing is the highest point, uh, print quality. In this case, Superfine 1440 or Photo, either one works. I don't like 1440 because then it goes 1440 DPI by 5760 DPI. And it's just a waste of ink. Your eye can hardly resolve 1440, which is why the inkjet printers have a tendency to work pretty darn good these days. So those are the three things. We want to choose the proper media. Make sure the color uh, management is off and the print quality. Once I do that, it takes me back to the Photoshop print settings. Can you get profiles for different papers, uh, Patrick asks? Absolutely. In fact, you want a, I, if I did not mention this when we were talking about printer profiles, I apologize. You want a separate printer profile for each paper surface that you have if you have your own inkjet printer. So if you've got a glossy surface, Epson glossy, you need a profile for that. If you have an Epson luster, you definitely need a different pro, a pro, a profile for that because the ink amount of ink that it soaks up versus a glossy is totally different. So it has to know what kind of paper and how many how much ink to set by. By the way, I don't use this printer driver for the light jet. We use something called a RIP or a raster image processor. We just take the file directly into the RIP. We do not use this printer driver. But if you've got your own, this is what you need to do. So we did that. We did the print settings. And the next down here says enable the printer's color management in the print settings dialogs box. No. Went down here. We want to choose Photoshop manages colors. Remember, in the printer, uh, the Epson printer dialog box, it turn we turn the color management off, right? So we only want to color manage once. 
So Photoshop manages colors, the engine for color management and color handling and Photoshop is far superior and robust to anything else out there. So you want to, uh, the color management portion. So you want to use Photoshop manages colors. And then printer profile. Remember I said when you're soft proofing, that's not where you're gonna plug it in for your printer. This is where you're gonna plug in your printer profile. So let's say, uh, what did I say, glossy? I don't think I have a glossy one, but that's okay, we'll use one of these. So I'll, even though it, it, we're, we said glossy paper, still, the printer profile for that paper, you can see this is one I made for my Epson 2880, Epson Luster, and uh, it uh, is, uh, was made on 418. Oh, and something else I did not mention when we were talking about profiles earlier, a monitor profile will drift it's very rare for a printer profile to drift. It may go three to five years before you notice any problems. That's assuming that you were using the proper ink, and that usually means the manufacturer's ink, not some uh, brand off of eBay, that, you know, Acme brand. Uh, you need to keep things consistent, otherwise that printer profile is no good. Okay, once I do that, I'm, I'm not gonna press print, obviously, because I don't have it on, but you can see that what I did, I went to print settings, very first thing, and I went in here and I went to my print settings, and again, this is in a Mac, and I chose photo paper, oops. Well, here, we'll be consistent, L luster. <laughs> the color is automatically turned off, and the reason the color is automatic, I'm sorry, the color settings is grayed out, is what I meant to say, because in Photoshop, in the Photoshop print dialog box, we said Photoshop manages colors. In a Mac, it will automatically turn it off in here for you. That's color sync. Then after we did those three things, the paper color settings with the no, no, uh, the color management off, and then the, uh, the best print quality without wasting ink, I'll hit save. It'll take me back to the Photoshop print settings. And uh, let's see here, Photoshop, a good question, Patrick. I'll talk about that in a second. Color handling, Photoshop manages colors. We wanna plug our profile in here for printing. And then this stuff, relative color metric and black point compensation should be exactly you see here. And at that point I would hit print and it will send it to the printer. Patrick asked, how important is the 12, 14 and 16 bit settings in your printer? You mean in your printer dialog box? I'm not sure. Uh, are, are you, you're, you're talking about. Right here where it says 16 bits a channel. No, you do not do not do any of that. Just leave that alone. And there's another dirty little secret. All printers, all printers, capital A-L-L, -L, all printers are 8 bit output. There, there is what was one 16-bit offset color printer in Heidelberg, Germany. And as far as I know, that thing, which is the size of a couple of freight trains, is still sitting there because nobody can really tell the difference between the 16-bit and the 8-bit processor, certainly not for the cost of that machine. So, uh, And I don't even know if that machine exists anymore, to be honest with you. But all output is 8-bit. Is, uh, Let the printer driver convert it for you. You do want to send it to the printer as a 16-bit file. Okay for this printer. Actually, that's not true. For uh, You want to send them as an 8-bit. In fact, if you guys recall, when we had that uh, uh, visual representation of a proper work workflow in, in Photoshop. Remember, we had the master file, and after the master file, we did some procedural things to it. I believe if you go back in there, it shows you when you need to, uh, let me do something here. There we go. It, it goes back to, uh, it'll tell you when to flatten it to 8-bit to flatten it and turn it into 8-bit, convert it to 8-bit. Okay, any questions on the first two-thirds of this meeting on color management before we go on to a quick uh, lesson on what a judge sees? Chris asks, oh, let me start with Janice first since we're there, and then uh, Chris, I'll come right back to you. Uh, should you always print high speed or finest detail? Uh, Generally speaking, Janine, yes, you should. So let me go back to that for a second and I'll show everybody what she's talking about. And I should have mentioned that. This would be under the print setting box right here, which will open the, well, in this case, it's a Mac 
printer driver box, but let's just say it's for the Epson because we picked our printer up here, even though of course it's off. When you go to the print settings in a Mac, right down here you have high speed. Yes, definitely you should have that on. Finest detail, it's really up to you. I've never noticed really much of a difference. I think that's just something they put in there, but the high speed makes a big difference and I'll tell you why. Back in the day when inkjet printers first came out, uh, photo inkjet printers in particular, the head, when it went across the paper, was unidirectional. It would go and print one way, stop, bring the print head back to the other side. Let's say it starts on the left, goes across and prints on the right, goes back, doesn't print. Okay. Now the heads, and because of the software and the stitching that they can do with the software, uh, high speed's fine. It, it can print in both directions. It can print bi-directional. So that's really what that one's about. The finest detail, uh, honestly, I, I haven't seen much difference between that uh, and off and on. Uh, you might want to play with that, but I don't think it's really uh, that important. It, it, the high speed isn't really even important. It won't affect your quality, but it will affect how long you've got to sit and wait, wait for your print. Hope that answers that question, Janine. Chris asked, you edit in fo Photoshop in 8 or 16-bit? Recall, Chris, that we are starting with a master file. And if you are starting with a master file with RAW, you want to leave your master file in 16-bit. And that's where you're going to do the majority of your editing. Remember, in the visual representation or even the workflow from the book, uh, you're, you're going raw into Photoshop, you're leaving it in 16-bit. It's not until after your master file is created and you've done all your creative mojo in the left side of that visual representation or the top half of that works, uh, workflow, workflow chart that uh, uh, you would procedurally uh, convert it to 8-bit after the fact. But no, your master file should be in 16-bit. I hope that answers that question. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and go to the next section here. And I'm gonna kind of breeze through this and there's, there's the notes on this are, are very, uh, we can go to page nine if you want, by the way, in the notes. And edit for success. And I'm going to, let's see, I'm gonna hide, do we need this anymore? We really don't. Let me go to, oh, wrong one, we did that. There you are. Okay, editing for set. A lot of this is going to seem kind of like we've already seen this. Well, I'm going to briefly go through some of this stuff that you've seen the last couple of times, or at least last week uh, on the class two. Um, and and what you need to ask yourself is, uh, this is kind of in the background. This is not really how to pick the 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 one. In fact, you know what? Just for the sake of time, I'm going to skip that. Well, first of all, page nine is a rehash of some of the things that we talked about in class two, where contrast, what the definition of contrast is and color. Uh, and of course, color in the box on page nine says the three main attributes of components of color are use, saturation, and luminous brightness. And again, this is all stuff that we covered in detail in class two. By the way, I just did another round of uh, class one through five classes for the rest of the summer, uh, pretty much every other Wednesday. So if you get a chance, you might want to go uh, check at Meetup and sign up for those. So if you didn't take class two or if you want to take it again, by all means, uh, these are different every time I do them. So a lot of what you see on page nine, we've already pretty much covered. So I'm going to go ahead and skip down through these. You guys probably re remember seeing all this, but let's go to really the subject of this edit for success. And let's start on page 10. Now, people ask us as judges, I do a lot of judging at the San Diego County Fair, the Orange County Fair, and, and various camera clubs. And man, I get to see some really neat stuff. And the stuff that jumps out at me, the people that did it had to have been a tough self-editor. So what makes it, you'll, on page 10, you'll see that we're able to control all the elements that we talked about on page nine, you know, contrast and whatever, with the exception of the last one, impact, feel, and creativity, the wow factor. And I like to call it wow factor because as you look at a strong image with impact, you want to say wow. It's my opinion that Photoshop used properly will take a good image and make it a very good image, and it will take a great image and make it a wow image. And so how do you increase your wow factor in an image? You want to increase its uniqueness ask yourself what makes a photograph unique. So I should also note that when I am editing, let me define editing first. Editing means I'm gonna go through 
images that I have taken and decide which ones I want to create a master file of. Okay. And that's not every image. We've talked about that before too. So only those images that I want to spend time in, pour my blood, sweat, and tears into it. Uh, that's the, what I'm choosing uh, when I'm editing. My ratio, to be honest with you, because I'm a very, very tough self-editor, and you should be too, my ratio is maybe a hundred out of uh, you know, one out of a hundred, maybe two, I might consider making a master file. But I'm a very tough self-editor. I learned that a long time ago. Back in the day, I can remember light tables the size of uh, doors set on their side. And like a billiard table, they had four corners with little pockets in the corner for trash. And they would take all their 35 millimeter slides from a chute, and they would literally go through them and they go, keep trash, 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 back up, trash, 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 back up, keep, okay? That's how they did it. Well, you're essentially doing the same thing here. I'm not going to get into the mechanics of choosing the image in your program, whether it's Lightroom, Bridge, uh, iPhoto, or whatever. But somewhere, you know, you can star them, you can rate them. That, that's not what we're talking about tonight. I'm talking about how you decide which is image is going to be the one that's going to knock you off your feet, that you feel really good about, that if you're involved in judging or uh, getting involved in contests, that a judge is going to go, wow. So I just want you to know you're going to need to be a tough, a tough, tough self-editor. Also on page 10, I talked about this last week a little bit too, and that's what we're going to spend the next 20 minutes on. Uh, John Sarkowski or, uh, is, is kind of one of my photographic idols uh, along with uh, uh, Ansel Adams. And John Sarkowski back in the 60s came up with what he called the five essential characteristics of photography. Concentrate on these and you'll increase your image's uniqueness. And... I, the reason I, I focus on these is because it, it makes sense. You'll, you'll see what I'm talking about as we go along. You get all five of these in, in one, and you've got one of the most unique, unique uh, uh, things on the planet. Uh, but it, even then, it's going to help you with just some little stuff, and you'll see what I mean. Sometimes just stepping one or two steps one way or another to get that perfect shot. So his five things are subject. And he says the thing itself, and he also says the, and it's meaning and symbolism, and that makes sense. Detail, frame, vantage point, and time. Now, what I'm going to do is, this is an article by a guy named uh, uh, Jim Austin, and I don't think I put his, I didn't, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put his and David King's, we're going to talk about his. I'm putting these in the chat. Jim Austin's uh, and David King's address uh, are in there. I would encourage you to check these out. Um, they are not in your notes. Dave King's is, but Jim's is not. And this, I would also count this as homework, if you will. So you might want to copy down that address for Jim Austin. It's jimages.com. And this is from an article he wrote for a magazine I used to write for called Apigee Photo. And uh, Jim really nailed this whole what makes a photograph unique. And he took some examples of each one of these five unique uh, essential characters, characteristics of photography. Now, remember, when John Sarkowski was around in the 60s, photography was not considered really the art form that it is today. It was still kind of the bastard child back in that day. So he did the world a favor by helping us point out some of this stuff. A lot of that, I'm sure, goes with painting too, but for us, it's perfect. So let's start with this one here, subject, and let me get this, my light out. I'm going to do just a little bit of reading here. Think of the Great Depression. One particular, this is, by the way, these are Jim Austin's words that I'm reading. And these are not in the notes. If you want copies of this, uh, uh, I'll find the article for you and I can send it to you. Think of the Great Depression. One particular image comes to mind. A mother holding her children, a determined set to her expression. The photographer, Dorothea Lange, was part of a government team charged to document our American life in the 1930s. Lange's 1935 portrait is now called Migrant Mother and is the symbol of the Great Depression. We've all seen this image. Lange's image became the central visual signpost for thousands of images of the era. And I just love these images and they, 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 they speak volumes. And so the subject was really killer in this, in this particular image. Let's go to the next one. What makes a photograph unique? The next uh, point is detail. And this is a picture, of course, of the great Winston Churchill. 
There's a wealth, again, I'm reading, I quote, there is a wealth of storytelling detail in this 1941 portrait of Churchill by Yusuf Karsh. The details of the prime minister's cane, handkerchief, and watch add to his persona. While we do not know that a moment earlier that Karsh took Churchill's cigar away from him, the intense expression that Karsh captured symbolizes how we think of Winston Churchill. And that's true. I mean, you can see the guy saying, never, never give up. So that's a really good example of, of, of detail. This is one I threw in of mine just to give you an idea and, and what I, I think is a, a good example of detail where there might even be an element of time to this one too, which is one of those that is discussed. But you can see there's just all sorts of fine detail. Everything is very sharp. Uh, there's some nice composition to it. So just another example of detail. Again, if we got any questions as we're going along, I, I, well, all I'm trying to do is show you some things that judges or people that have been in the business. Jim Austin's have been a pro's pro for years, and so has David King. Uh, my specialty is post-processing, but I've seen enough of what works and what doesn't to really appreciate uh, uh, these five points, these five essential characteristics. By the way, and I should mention on the bottom of page 10, there is a link. Uh, to search John Sarkowski five characteristics because there's a hundred articles on uh, his five characteristics and everybody has a little different uh, 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 viewpoint or angle about one of these five. So I would encourage you as homework to spend some time looking through some of John Sarkowski's. He also has a book. Uh, I don't remember what it's called uh, exactly, but the book goes over uh, the five essential characteristics also and I mean, it's it's cheap it's fifteen dollars maybe on amazon okay frame what makes a, a photograph unique frame on the screen here and master photographers compose with a rightness of framing everything that appears in this photograph is essential compositions are often stark direct and honest ben Sean's ben 1938 image below was taken outside an amp store in somerset ohio what is left out of the portrait is as important as what sean put in its framing gives us a location, tells the season, offers hints about the era, and frames humanity in the in the moment. Everything in Sean's frame needs to be there. And I think that's a really good way of putting it. Let me go to the next one here. Vantage point. By the way, I try to take, when I'm out shooting, I try to keep one of these five in mind. And vantage point for me is the easiest one to do because I got tall arms we were talking about patrick last week when he goes out and shoots patrick takes a ladder with him a good portion of the time because of the stuff that he's shooting he needs to look down or the place is on a stage that uh, the, the subject is on a stage that sort of thing so vantage point is critical and uh, uh to me anyway so this is an image here let's what's it say marion post Woolcott stood inside a tobacco barn in mibane i hope i'm pronouncing that right mibane north carolina and shot down a wooden floor to the street for her image she chose the vantage point that defines the action of organizing tobacco baskets Wolcott's technical skill with the details of time, place, and subject make for a compelling image. We can even pick out the cars in the background of those Model T Fords. There's one with three of those elements, time, place, and subject. Okay, well, place isn't listed, but still, you get the idea. Okay, and here's another example. This is a real quick example, just so you know. Uh, and and I, this is, I do not mean to compare myself to all these greats that I'm showing you these images of, but this is from my iPhone. And this is a really, really interesting example of vantage point. This is the fountain in front of the San Diego County Fair. Those are my three incredibly uh, talented, gifted, and beautiful grandkids. <clears throat> They're a little older now. He's 12, she's 10, and he's eight. But anyway, just by taking and putting my arm up and shooting down on it, it totally changed the the whole concept to what this thing is all about not only are you seeing the kids but you're seeing the water that they're playing in which you can't see in the other one so sometimes just taking a step or two in one direction or the other makes all the, the difference in the world okay let's go to the next one here what makes a photograph unique time this is uh, i mentioned that i like to to challenge myself to focus on one of the five essential characteristics. Time is the toughest one for me, although maybe that one I showed you earlier, the train, because it is an older train, maybe touches on time a little bit. Here's what he says. All photographs involve time. It's passage, space time, surreal time, hyper real time. Time is illusion, static time. Some images involve time as an icon, other use time as a symbol. Modern advertising for the web seems to be driven by market needs involving shorter slices of time. So again, I would encourage you to study these five 
and look for other sources. Uh, again, at the bottom of page 10, you can Google that and find a, a whole bunch of examples, including I'm sure that his book is listed there too for sale. Uh, I would not be surprised if it wasn't. So uh, the, to finish off uh, that little section, the symbolic, this, again, I'm quoting Jim, the symbolic nature of master photographs takes them beyond the subject. Details invite us to return to look again and again. Framing confers importance of all that the photographer has included in the scene. Vantage point is crucial. Moving the camera a few inches makes a difference between a picture and a master photograph. Time is woven into all photographs. That's true. And as it passes, elevates the status of a photograph. That's true also. Okay, so those are those five elements. The other thing I want to show you is some stuff that Dave, has anybody got any questions at this point? For those that don't know David King, David King is a cowboy from Wyoming that pulls no punches. And when he is tough on you, is tough love. He wants to see you do better. So sometimes his insights can be a little biting. But again, give yourself a, a what, what's the... Uh, a hide of, uh, of uh, a rhinoceros hide and a heart of whatever. You know the phrase. What I'm saying is, well, you're going to be a tough self-editor. You know, say, eh, that's okay, but this one's okay. This one's much more okay. This one's just not worth the trouble, blah, blah, blah. Okay, be a tough self-editor. And I think that if you study these five essential characteristics and apply them compared to what I'm going to tell you over the next 10 minutes from Dave, that you will get an idea of how to approach your your craft a little bit better a lot better actually well i'm on page 11 by the way and what i'm gonna read to you again is just excerpts that covers everything we see here on uh, 11 and as you also see on the screen uh you can find these by going to the link near the bottom that says watchdigital.com sdc fair faq and then scroll to the bottom dave taught photography at the san diego uh, city college and eloquently makes the same observations that Larry, myself, and a whole bunch of other judges in, in the same contest with a healthy dose of much appreciated tough love to boot. Again, this is homework. I would go and read this article com completely. One of the things, here's, this is Dave. This is classic Dave. If you are an amateur shooter clicking blithely away, taking happy snaps on a family vacation, or honestly, a want to be serious photographer, but who's not willing to give it any more effort or time than the tourists, then it hardly matters. Keep your day job. But if you're trying to produce a visual work of art, something worthy of inclusion in an international exhibition of photography, that the images you create need to be made and not just taken. Okay, so and that implies a large part of the result depends on you and your input. You are in control, not the camera, not the process of editing you. So uh, self-editing, a brutal, painful, but honest evaluation of own, one's own work is the hallmarks of a professional grade photographer. He said professional grade. I think we all strive for excellence at one point or another. And so that's all we're trying to do here. Uh, let's go to cropping. Uh, first bullet point here. Well, I'll just read it. Many of the images certainly contained a good photograph in there somewhere, but it is not the judge's job to find it. What I'm going to tell you is this. One of the number one abuses is you're not cropping right. You're not cropping enough. That's probably one of the, if not the number, uh, number one uh, abuse, just so you know. Uh, so uh, a lot of the images could have been so much better and so much more visually powerful if the photographer had gotten closer or cropped them in the processing. I was surprised at how many of them contained extraneous and even distracting elements competing with the assumed actual fo focal point. Cropping is a major element in basic composition, okay? HDR abuses. I'm not a big HDR fan. And actually, uh, in addition to HDR, I want to include layer masks in this. One of the things that we see a lot, particularly with HDR, is people overprocess the HDR to the point where there's a halo around things, like it's glowing. And, and it's a really bad look. And with proper HDR, if you're into HDR, with proper uh, HDR post-processing, you shouldn't have those. If you're using layer masks in Photoshop, which is my preferred method rather than HDR, uh, and you have a bad border between your layer mask and the rest of the image, it's going to show. And it shows, or it's got a halo or whatever, then you're doing something wrong. And chances are it's going to get kicked out in uh tier one in the contest. But for those who don't know, for the San Diego County Fair photo contest, which is one of the largest in the world, I'm sorry, in the United States, uh, it uh, 
has a two-tier process. The first tier is you send in a JPEG and uh, about 35 judges, we come in on one day and we've got 15 monitors, well, more like 45 actually. We come in and we got 15 monitors set up and three judges around each one of those monitors. And yes, those monitors are calibrated and profiled before we meet by yours truly and Gene Wild and uh, Lois Funk Sakai, the uh, coordinators of the fair. So we we see this stuff a lot and, and w something with HDR abuses is going to get kicked out in the first, I mean, in, in tier one. And, and a lot of times in, uh, in, in uh, with cropping too. In fact, it's true for all of these. Sunsets. Okay, this is classic day. We all like sunsets. Gosh, they just make us feel all warm and fuzzy. When we are standing in front of a great sunset, however, especially in the midst of an emotional moment, we are mesmerized at the beauty. But our personal reaction is no small part due to the emotional content of the moment, the brilliant colors, blah, blah, blah. But let me keep reading here. By, by themselves, sunsets are fun to experience, but not at all thrilling when abstracted into two dimensions and lacking the evening breeze, the sounds, the environment, so, what, so, what, uh, so on and so forth. So, sometimes we judges would say something like, great sunset. Too bad they did not find a photograph in which to use it, okay? And that's true. One of the most successful sunset photographs uh, are things like uh, they have a, a person in it that's looking at it or uh, a surfer, perhaps, uh, something over and above the sunset. You have to get real creative with it, but sunsets by themselves will not make it. Uh, let's see here. Category choice. I'm not going to spend any time on that one. That's That's... There are plenty of resources for that. Uh, uh, the category choices, if it's, anyway, it, it depends on the contest too. Horizons, nine times out of 10, if you're not straightening your horizon, it's gonna get noticed by the judges unless it's on purpose and really adds to the image, uh, you're gonna get kicked out if you don't have a straightened horizon. Uh, editing, let's see. I think we pretty much are just kind of talking about that now, uh, you know, that, uh, in, in this context, he's talking about having it properly processed and printed or edited edited as a photo. And, you know, things like focus, uh, uh, too light, too dark, uh, that kind of thing. If it's not done properly, uh, you know, like I said, you can take a good image and make it great in Photoshop. You can take a great image and make it a wow image in Photoshop. Keep that in mind when you're, you're going through and picking out those images that you want. This one bugaboo for me and and perhaps it's because I've been doing it forever existing in common images I cannot tell you how many pictures I've seen of the Coronado Bay Bridge great bridge love the Coronado Bay Bridge but there's a lot of photos out there and so it better be extraordinary it better be from a different uh, viewpoint uh, a vantage point one of those five things that we talked about okay so existing common images you'll see what he says here uh some geographical, now nah, I'm not even going to bother. I'll let you guys read the article. Uh, uh, but he basically is saying, you know, if it's a common place, you better look for an uncommon angle, no pun intended. Something needs to be different about it. Something needs to be unique about it. Composition, we pretty much have kind of talked about that one. That kind of goes hand in hand with uh, the cropping that we talked about. Print quality. Print quality. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you've got a poor quality print, a print, then, uh, you know, it, it's really a shame. Some of the images that I see that I know, I know that if they had given me the raw file, it could have been a dynamite image. In other words, they took a very good image and made it a ho-hum print. And if you're going to enter the fair, you might as well get it done right. And you know, depending on whether you're using myself for prints or Chrome or uh, any of those kinds of places. Even Bay Photo does some pretty darn good printing. Um, but just make sure that the print looks like your image. You know, if you've got an image back and it's too light and it's got kinks and fingerprints all over it, you know, and, and then you mount that on a piece of artboard from Walmart and try to turn that in, you will get laughed out. They won't even enter it. We've had prints like that. You know, where the, the, the mounting and the, and the print quality were so poor that we just had to turn it away because it's a representation of what we think are good images anyway. Exposure shouldn't be even an issue, but if you're not bracketing for your important stuff, you should get into the habit. Okay. Uh, I tend to be an advocate of the exposing to the left in your histogram. And if you're not checking your histogram when you're shooting, then you're missing the boat. Okay. Bracket so that you know you, if you're going to go all the trouble to, to, find someplace, at least, you know, do what you got to, to capture the moment. 
over sharpening and over saturation over sharpening can be a real problem if it's over sharpened it'll look like blocks and it, it it's it's a very unappealing look over saturation uh if your flower wasn't red to begin with and you try to oversaturate it and and it comes out looking electric it's not going to make it it's not going to be a good image okay i think that pretty much covers everything that we have if y'all are uh, interested in being on my mailing list it's always a lot of fun uh I, i'll put you know uh, something funny in there and something like uh, we'll be talking about light chasers here in san diego which is a facebook group uh, i try to put something community in each one and so that's what we we'll talked about this time don't forget your homework guys although i mean you know you it, it, particularly in a subject like this and uh i think that's pretty much it guys went a little long tonight which is unusual uh oh no i guess i didn't 731 oh 732 so i guess that's not too bad okay troops thanks a lot god bless you bye